So, uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I really like uh, the idea that uh, this discussion on commons is being developed through various networks, uh, that is, through forms that are suitable for the, the process uh, that corresponds to commoning. And allow me to share some thoughts with you in the process of uh, trying to enter a discussion that is uh, obviously a discussion that has uh, conflicting points of view. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the discussion on commons is simply a discussion on a very specific topic on which we all agree. It's rather a, a process through which we keep on defining the terms, keep on defining the points of view, and take insights if you want. So my way of entering this discussion is putting an emphasis rather on the politics of commoning uh, and not on the e economy of commoning. Uh, this, of course, make it more, makes it more suitable uh, in the context of your discussions and, and your, uh, your workshops in this uh, summer school. But also, uh, I think, is already a form of taking sides in uh, an ongoing uh, dispute, an ongoing debate about the meaning of commons. So I would, uh, first of all, attempt to enter this discussion by trying to understand uh, what a community might be in the context of the discussion of commoning. I start with, uh, uh, with uh, Ranchier's uh, understanding of, uh, of politics, uh, which I think is a, a really uh, helpful understanding in the context of our um, um, discussion on commons, because he conceives politics as a polemic over the common. Indeed, the community is based on this polemic over the common. And when this polemic over the common, which I will try shortly to describe how I understand it, is, uh, is uh, not taking place, is uh, kind of stopped, then Ranchier thinks that uh, community, society in general, evolves to a kind of police order. Yes, probably the term is a bit too exaggerated uh, as, a as a term, but indeed tries to mark the difference between politics as a movement, as a process of movement, uh, the, 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 the continuous dispute over what it is that we should consider as common, uh, as opposed to a society which, which is kind of ossified, fossilized, uh, does not breathe, does not change, does not transform itself, and ends up being a kind of fixed order. So I think uh, if we combine this idea with the idea coming from a, a theorist uh, uh, from Uruguay, from uh, Latin America, who believes that indeed a community is a process and not a stable arrangement of, of uh, relations that keeps on repeating itself, <coughs> Then we end up understanding, uh, indeed, uh, community as a process through which a common world is created. A common world can be, of course, an enclosed common world, that is a world that we are forced to share, that we are forced to participate, and in this way we are forced to agree with the major presuppositions that are supporting this common world, or and I would tend to support the next, the, this, this uh, understanding of the common world, or a common world can be a process. A common world as a process may correspond to a community as a process, to a community as a process which is being developed through various forms of polemic over the common. And I would, uh, in this, in this uh, conceptualization of, of community, I would connect an understanding of commons and commoning indeed again as a process that does not simply try to establish certain forms of sharing or certain items, products, things to be shared, but indeed a process through which what is to be considered as common is to be redefined. It's a, it's a dynamic pro process. That's why I try to, to integrate to this 
uh, to this understanding of commons, two contributions. The one is probably you know most of you, the definition by David Harvey, which is a bit complicated, but what it says in the end is that it's more commons is not a thing, but a relation, okay? is a relation which is, I would add, which is performed. It happens. It takes place in a certain context, a social context. I would uh, try to compare this understanding of commons, the definition of a common word, which is a process, which is based on the creation and the, and the dispute about social relations, with the idea of communalidad, which is an idea that comes actually from Latin America also. Uh, <clears throat> it is a made term, uh, and it's probably made mostly by, uh, by people who were, by scholars who were involved with indigenous thought. And they try to express with this word uh, not the fact that we have something in common, communalidad, commonality is being translated usually in, in English, but it's not easy easily uh, a good translation. I, I believe that there's, it leaves a lot out. Huh? Communalidad is, as Esteva tries to say, the juxtaposition of commons and polity. It is a process that defines its stakes and also takes place. Okay? So, uh, from that, from the comparison between the idea that commons is a relation which is being performed, and also community is a process through which stakes are being defined and a polemic over the common develops, I end up uh, thinking about commons, uh, trying to use mostly commoning rather than commons as a thing, or commons as an area of, of, uh, of investigation. If commoning is to be a process, because in commoning not only what is at stake in sharing is being defined, but also a community that defines itself through commoning, then commoning is indeed a dynamic process that could possibly lead to a transgression, to a kind of after, a beyond existing capitalist societies, and I would try to explore a bit this possibility. <clears throat> uh, to connect this to the city, uh, if the city is not simply an arrangement of places, okay, if, if the city is not simply an order, a spatial order, but indeed the city also is a space of possibilities, or if you want, is a performed space, a space which happens because people are being uh, related to each other, then urban commoning might be a, a, a kind of commoning, a, a, an aspect of commoning perhaps, which at least as I understand it, should not only be connected to things that happen or exist in the city, or to resources connected with the urban environment, but perhaps urban commoning has to do with urban space, both as a medium and as a stake. Okay? Urban space can be indeed a form of shared thing, a kind of commons, but what distinguishes, I think, urban space from other kinds of commons is the fact that urban space is also a shaping factor of processes of commoning. So this is how I would try to... Oops, I did something wrong. No. This is why I will try to connect this discussion to the idea of institutions. Uh, <clears throat> let's remember community as a polemic over the common, a process through which the common is being defined. What is the role of institutions? Uh, what do we mean by institutions? Allow me to, to take uh, uh, a definition or an understanding of institution that does not come from political theory, but rather from anthropology, which means that institutions are not simply uh, forms that uh, are reproducing existing relations of power, but perhaps in a more general sense, are tools, social tools, through which a repeatability of actions, a predictability of actions is being uh, implemented. If we take this rather broad definition, which of course includes relations of power, but it's more than that, then <coughs> um, it is important to see 
how institutions are, can be connected to processes of commoning. Is commoning establishing itself through forms of repeatability? And what kinds of forms of repeatability can go along with an ongoing process of definition of the commons? What kinds of form of repeatability can go along with a polemic over the common? It seems to be a kind of contradiction, OK? But come on. I'm just used to another kind of computer and pressing the wrong buttons. <clears throat> so I think that we should and can distinguish between two at least different kinds of institutions that are, can be connected to commoning according to some definitions that have to do with uh, the well-known uh, understanding of commons by Harden Engry and relevant thinkers, as G.G. Rogero, there are institutions, that is, forms of repeatability, forms of definition of reproduction of acts and meanings, through which, indeed, uh, the common is being corrupted. That's the term they use. That is, uh, at least to my understanding, these are forms through which the common loses its meaning. It's being transformed, perhaps, to its opposite. And how is commons, or, or how is commoning as a process, can be transformed to its opposite? If it is directed, not to a, to, to, to a condition through which people share things and define what is to be shared, but rather to a condition through which certain people define for all the others what is to be shared, under what conditions, and enclose the process, that is, define the limits of this process. And indeed, this kind of institutions corresponds to the city as a, an agglomeration of enclaves. You, you probably are well familiar with this discussion. Today's cities are more like uh, um, uh, forms of, uh, of, of relations that de define a kind of uh, uh, order which is not the order of the city of zones, or the fantasized order of the city of zones, to be more accurate, but it's rather the peculiar and, and uh, sometimes not easily uh, traceable order of the city of enclaves. That is, self-defining and self-enclosing areas in which certain uh, procedures are being, uh, being performed, certain acts are being per permitted, certain behaviors are being encouraged. So the city of enclaves indeed produces institutions that corrupt the common because it tends to enclose in those enclaves areas of potential sharing, but in which those who participate in the sharing are not allowed most of the times to define the rules, are not allowed to question or to challenge the laws. Mostly they are allowed to enter this process of sharing without, however, being able to define the rules. And sometimes what they share is probably their misery or their, their, their idea of being excluded from this enclave. So we know these are very well-known pictures, just to remind you. A gated community is, a, is an enclave, uh, an urban enclave, that can be considered as an area in which the commons is being corrupted. Okay? In, a, in a gated community, commoning appears to be a process through which certain uh, inhabitants share certain facilities, share all, also may share certain processes. There are, in many cases, a, a kind of uh, imitation of the very process through which people uh, participate in taking decisions, but in the end they do not take decisions. They simply participate in a simulation of participatory democracy. Most of the times they simply share some facilities uh, and, a, and a board of uh, managers takes most of the decisions. So this is a corrupted area of commoning. Uh, however, we can learn from aspects of urban commoning uh, which indeed happen in our cities, and try to understand if there are possibilities of urban commoning inside, inherent possibilities in urban, in urban commoning that can go beyond existing uh, domination and existing capitalist relations. And I would briefly say that we have at least three, uh, two areas in which we can find uh, institutions of commoning that tend to be open, that is not corrupted. First, this is the area of, of everyday survival. We live in cities, these are 
from Athens, but it could be from many places of the world. Uh, the, uh, we live in cities in which uh, various populations, various cultures, various kinds of people who sometimes are chased from their places, they, they didn't choose to leave their place, they were forced to leave their, place, their places, and so they were kind of uh, forced to organize their own common spaces, that is shared spaces, in a hostile environment. Sometimes this kind of common space tends to be, tends to look like an enclave space, that is, an enclave of not exactly misery, but attempting to protect their own minimum standards of common life in a hostile environment. But some other times, and I think these are cases in which common or shared spaces are being used uh, uh, in ways that transcend the barriers or the frontiers or the boundaries that are being shaped around them. They kind of create porous, porous uh, perimeters through which they overspill the barriers that are being erected around them, so they do not uh, become forms of self-ghetto, uh, experience, uh, self-ghettoized experiences. In those cases, we f- we tend to see forms through which people, actually the users of space, tend to participate in the processes through which space is being defined and to participate also in the rules being shaped in those spaces. Uh, Obviously, I will not have the time to discuss in detail each one of these images, but just they are there to show show you that those, those kinds of spaces can be more or less ephemeral, they can be formed in uh, the one, most of the, the pictures before were from Athens, but the one above is from Barcelona, obviously for those who know Barcelona, is the Macua. Um, <clears throat> so you have places in which even in temporary appropriations, you have a community which is emergent, is not very well established, it's becoming, it's, it exists in a process of defining itself and defining its space as shared space. And in those cases, I think, what we might call forms of repeatability or institutions, indeed develop ad hoc and in a process of being um, defined by those who participate in space. Um, these are images from uh, Havana, Cuba. I think this, this is also a very interesting uh, space in which informal practices of public space appropriation, it did develop uh, interesting areas of uh, of commoning <coughs> that are being formed. It's more like a chain of actions, a chain of uh, initiatives that happen on a network of spaces which are which define the the the, the water front of the of the city. <coughs> so, what kind of what kind of institutions would be those that sustain and expand commoning? I would say that we can uh, at least. Uh, find three important characteristics of those institutions if those institutions are meant to sustain and expand commoning, that is, fight against its possible enclosure. Because I think, to say it in, a, in one word, whatever process tends to define commons or commoning uh, as a process which is closed and refers to a very specific and stable community will end up eventually in destroying commoning will end up eventually in reversing the meaning of commoning. So I would say to, to describe at least three of the, of the characteristics of those institutions. First of all, those institutions should be forms to which repeatability establishes kinds of comparability. The possibility of being with others and comparing what you want and what they want. Comparability is like not simply tolerating difference, but making difference relevant. So, to, so if we are in a process through which a common word is defined not simply as a homogeneous area in which people who share exactly the same values and the same habits participate, but a common word may be defined as a process through which people enter newcomers in, 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 in Ranchier's uh, terms enter this common world and become uh, co-producers of the characteristics of those of this common world, then this world should give them the opportunity to compare. And what's more than that, to translate. Translation is not, as we know from 
from literature, uh, very accurate science or whatever, very accurate practice. It always needs to readjust. It's never finished, but it means to establish a correspondence. It doesn't abandon this scope. So translation is actually a process through which people may be discovered in the process of co-producing a common word, the fact that they can be different, however, equally members of this common world. Okay? So let us not try to understand the common world and the practices of common as practices and, and things, and, and sorry, not things, ideas through which we understand the common as what we share as a common identity. No, the common is more than that, is a process through which we establish comparisons, translations, and indeed we discover forms through which the ultimate sharing should be established. And I think the ultimate form of sharing is the sharing of power. It is on that form of sharing that the meaning of sharing should be based. If we don't, in a process of commoning, in the process of creating a common world, establish tools, artifices of equality, as Rocher says, that are being uh, mechanisms through which we try to avoid, try to discourage, try to prohibit, try to fight against the creation, the accumulation of power, if we don't uh, create, if we don't invent these kind of artifices of, of equality, then any form of sharing we tend to reverse itself to enclosure either an enclosure of an elitist group or an enclosure of a group that shares uh, lots of its uh, bad uh, conditions, but not lots of its potentiality of transcending those conditions. A ghetto, if you want. So, <clears throat> uh, in, in this process, I would uh, introduce the idea of thresholds. Uh, as the speciality which corresponds to these institutions, to these forms of commoning that are being always open to newcomers and introduce forms of comparability, repeatability, and sharing of power. If en enclave speciality corresponds to the enclosure of commons, I think that threshold speciality, that is a speciality of comparisons, what is a threshold? It's an area in between. It gives you the possibility to compare an inside and an outside, to compare adjacent areas, to compare adjacent uh, behaviors, practices. Huh? A threshold light situation is a situation which is in between, and it creates the possibility of comparison. So I think threshold speciality would rather correspond to the idea of an expanding commoning and to the institutions that correspond to forms of expanding commoning, that is, Commoning that it is that is always alive, always overspilling the boundaries of a certain society, uh, community. A few images uh, as as examples. <coughs> this, as you read, is a uh, self-constructed uh, settlement in uh, São Paulo. What is a uh, distinguishing characteristic of this settlement, which is not as as one more favela, but it is indeed a result of the practices of a certain group of homeless people which is organized politically, is producing its own common space, its own common facilities, which are rather, which are rather poor, as you see. This would be the, the, the equivalent of a kindergarten in our societies, but indeed it is a voluntary uh, contribution. And this would be a multi-use uh, area, uh, cultural multi-use area. This is how they have created it. But indeed, it is being also a space which being created through the active participation of those who define the rules of use, of those who extend it beyond the borders of a certain enclave speciality. Okay. And it is also a process through which people keep on defining what is to be shared. Another example from Buenos Aires, <coughs> also is a, this is a, a voluntary work in a favela in Buenos Aires, in Visia uh, 31, as they call it, where uh, people actually participate in creating common, uh, common facilities, but they are not 
in a way of the philanthropic uh, contribution, which means we come from outside, we give you something that we need, that you need. No, this is a process which continues negotiations, define what is to be shared, what this community needs, but how it can connect to various other needs. And I think the most important need of those uh, areas in Buenos Aires and in many other uh, um, enclaves of, of poor is the need to connect to the city. They want to be part of the city. And maybe resonances of the discussion on the right to the city can come to this discussion. Indeed, to participate in the city is to be able to define the city, as Lefebvre said. It's not simply to participate in some certain assets connected to the city or services connected to the city. As you probably remember, Lefebvre was talking about the city as, a, as an ever, as a work of art. Okay? So the ultimate expression of the right to the city is the possibility of defining the city, of creating the city collectively. So this is also uh, a modest idea of, of the right to the city, but a very brave one, if you want, if you see the conditions. And also, of course, most of the times it ends with uh, uh, collective eating. I will bypass this example and finish with my idea about how, what can we learn about the recent squares movement, Indignados movement and Occupy movement as a form of extending uh, processes and experimental forms of urban community. <clears throat> I think the fact that these processes were connected to a very extensive and actual Actual, I will describe the word. I will define the word actually in a moment. An actual discussion about the meaning of democracy gives to the discussion of commoning a very important aspect. So, in the squares, I think what was uh, invented again was indeed the process through which commoning can become an open set of practices that defines its own rules. And the meaning of democracy was indeed that. To discover radical democracy would mean to discover the forms of participation that can end up in institutions, the, the way, of course, that I have tried to discover the word institutions. So I would tend to see in Sidagma Square occupation, for example, in which I was lucky to be part of, I would tend to see that those practices were indeed inventing themselves, not simply as forms of doing things, but as forms of establishing uh, repeatability. It's a media center, but also a dance. It's a form of cleaning the square, but also a form of coordinating bodies. Huh? What is a, in the end democracy? Is democracy simply uh, the creation of a common world through an exchange of opinions? which are supposed to be equal, and so on and so forth. No, probably it is more than that. It's a set of practices that tend to support these exchanges, and it is also a discussion on, on forms through which those practices are meant to be regulated, are meant to be coordinated, are meant to be um, uh, uh, processes through which what is to be said is constantly under definition. <coughs> Just to remind you, the same things happen in, uh, in Spain, in the Gnados movement, in Tahrir, and of course we are in Gezi, Gezi, and we know that this was a very important experience also in Istanbul. To finish here, I would suggest that the idea of threshold commons could be helpful in trying to understand or to distinguish the forms through which we understand uh, urban commoning as an, uh, as an open process. If urban commoning is not simply a form of defining urban space as something to be shared, but explicitly gets involved in using space as a shaping factor of institutions of commoning, so if urban commoning does not refer to space as a thing, but also to space as a medium, as a shaping factor, then perhaps this urban commoning indeed has the characteristic of threshold in all three levels. The first level is the kind of spaces it produces. If we call common space as quite distinct, we might have the opportunity to discuss the distinction between common space and public space. I did not kind of dwell on that, but I can return to this discussion if it's important, if you think it's important. So, um, 
threshold space, common space is threshold space. On the second level, institutions are of a threshold character, that is, they are always being shaped through processes of negotiation in which comparability and translatability indeed take specific form, are being performed. And the third level, if you want, is the fact that the very subjects who participate in those processes tend to become thres threshold entities. Not, of course, in the way that uh, Victor Turner or other anthropologists describe uh, those who are members of an initiative process, in the process of, not initiative process, wrong word, in the process of initiation, hmm? uh, like coming from uh, childhood to adolescence. Yeah? You are a threshold uh, figure because you are not yet adolescent, but you are not anymore a child. But let's try to think about this kind of threshold quality of subjectivity, this kind of threshold quality of identity. If people can become what they are meant to be, but through a process in which they are actively contributing to that, or if people can even defy what they are meant to be, so in defining this common word, they are actively participating in the process of descri describing and creating their own identities, then perhaps what in the end a social or a political identity is, is something that happens through constant negotiations in the process of open and expanding governing. Let's try to, to, to understand the pro this process as an open process, even on the level of identities. And it is indeed something that we have seen in the squares. People were not simply taking their identities to the square. If you see a teacher who, who wants to contribute to a common uh, uh, initiative in helping immigrant children to learn the language of the host, so-called host country, then this guy is not simply a teacher anymore. If you see a doctor who tries to be part of a, of a self-managed medical center, especially in cases in which you, you have to uh, take care of victims of, of, of police uh, aggression, then you are not simply a doctor. You are changing by contributing to this process. You are even changing your identity. You are challenging the stability of this identity. And I think we can say that this is indeed <coughs> a, a threshold identity too. So to, uh, so to uh, sum up, I think that we need to understand commoning as a process which is being developed through threshold <coughs> qualities of space threshold qualities of institutions, and threshold qualities of identity. Thank you very much. OK, we'll take a couple of questions for clarifications. But I invite you, again, to uh, write down the more um, explorative, the more deep questions that might have come up from the lecture. And we'll come back to them after the coffee break. So now just a few questions on what Stavros has uh, talked about clarifications, doubts. <coughs> uh, thanks for the presentation. You presented mostly work related to urban commoning. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just very quickly say if there is a lot of work on rural commoning or what can you tell us about that? Thanks. Well, I don't feel that I am um, very um, well informed about the processes of uh, rural commoning. I tend to think that even in rural commoning, however, we need to develop equally institutions, subjectivities, and forms of negotiation that are being always including newcomers. And that's that I would think that it is a very important characteristic of any kind of commoning. But I'm not sure if how this idea of uh, urban space as a shared medium and a shaping factor applies exactly to the understanding of rural commons. One thing I would uh, also attempt to, to, to support is that in, indeed we need to, to take this discussion out of a kind of essentialism that connects, to, to connects rural commons to specific uh, identifiable uh, resources or things. 
it's even, I don't know if it looks a bit uh, too much to say that even water does not exist out there. It becomes a stake of urban commoning, of commoning in general, sorry. It becomes a stake as long as we define it socially. So water is not uh, an entity, uh, is not a chemical compound, obviously. It's something that we need for something. And uh, describing uh, the rules through which we should regulate the use of this that we need and the forms through which we can define it as, as socially meaningful uh, product is indeed the process through which water becomes a social, uh, a social uh, construction. For example, if you see a fountain in the middle of, uh, uh, of a large villa in Tunis or in Morocco, you know very well that this water, which is being wasted in a way, is a definition of a social condition, is a definition of a hegemonic role of this person who has the power to throw water or to expose the, 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 the power to use water. Huh? So water is indeed... But I deeply respect all those discussions having to do with rural commons. I'm not part of those discussions, however. Maybe the question that you raise yourself, the difference between public and commons, either now or you could do, we could do it later also. But I was curious to know what, how you separate them. Yes, I was thinking that this, this discussion might be more interesting in the context of the workshop that we have later because it's one of the questions that has been addressed, but we can open it, of course. Uh, just to, to say it in a few words, I believe that the difference between public space and common space is the fact that public space is the product of a certain authority which authorizes the use of this space under certain rules, under certain conditions, and allows people to use this space by keeping the role of a guarantor of this use. This authority can be more or less democratic. It can be despotic, it can be anything. But it still remains an authority which is absolutely distinct, distinguishable from those who use the space. Common space, on the other side, is a space which is being developed by, uh, by those who are meant to be the users. And the rules are not, uh, do not pre-exist or are not imposed by an outsider who, of course, might guarantee the right use of space. The rules in common space are a matter of negotiations and especially between those who enter common space. And at least to my understanding of common space, I would add the, the important ingredient of openness, of expandability. Common space is not really absolutely definable within certain boundaries. It tends to become always open, tends to overfill the boundaries of, of uh, being imposed or being created by those who use it. That is what happened to the areas of, of Gezi, to the areas of Porta de Sol, to the areas of Sidangna Square. This was not, it was mostly the attacking forces of police that were trying to convert this open space to an enclave. So the need to, to fight back the, the, uh, the, the attacking police forces sometimes has enclosed this kind of common space. But the actual texture of this kind of space was to go beyond its own boundaries, I think. So this is my, my idea of difference. Hello, thank you very much for your contribution. I was very excited to see that uh, Somebody is using Rancière to start the discussion about Kamenu. A big fan of Rancière. But I want to ask you about... Because um, I, I had the same feeling that his definition of politics as dissensus and what we have in common is fantastic. But then reading more and thinking more, I realized that... Okay, first of all, he's not referring to what we have in common as, you said, resources of things or things. It's about processes as well. but we are tempted to see what we have in common as how we socially define, let's say, uh, the, the use of certain resources. But in the end, we kind of are drawn back to things and 
and what we share. While my reading of Ranciere was very much connected, and this is where I want to ask you if you are using his definition of um, politics, aesthetic politics, as distribution of the sensible world. So for him, what we have in common is a redistribution. I mean, it's always about redistributing the sensible world. And this sensible world is not just about effect, effective politics or emotion. So he's trying to develop much more about that. And I have trouble in putting that into words in my writing. I wonder if you are writing about this and how. Indeed, there are many other aspects of uh, uh, Ranchier's theory that can be integrated in the discussion of, of commons uh, or commoning. And you are very, uh, very accurate and very right. He is indeed suggesting that the process through which the redefinition of, of the common world is a process of a redefinition of the distribution of the sensible, which is what, what can be talked about, what can be understood, what can be visualized. Huh? Okay. And I think this is a, a very important contribution because it is a step further from the analysis of ideology. Ideology more or less stays on the fact that we are dominated by dominant ideas. And he says, no, we are dominated by dominant uh, forms of understanding. And uh, even uh, we are so dominated that, that we cannot think otherwise sometimes. I'm not sure that I follow his kind of uh, deterministic approach on this level. I think, for example, he is always against any kind of uh, consensus. And he talks about the census. I think that what we have learned from the squares is that it's not a matter of avoiding consensus. It's a matter of how we build forms of an agreement. For example, if in agreement we're not simply voters, but we might see that, OK, more or less most of you have this opinion. OK, I will step back. I will, net, I will not fight to be recognized as, as a minority because I trust you. We have this process through which we have built the trust in which we can base our next steps. So there are forms of consensus that are not necessarily linked to, to domination or to police order. <coughs> and also there are, there are forms of understanding the beyond of the existing distribution of sensible that can happen nevertheless through practices. It's not simply the entering of those who do not have a share, as, as Ranchier says. I tend to use more, more uh, Godelier's idea on that, who says that, OK, existing prohibitions really exist because we can think of doing what they prohibit. Even the incest taboo exists because people tend to bypass it or to, OK? So if anthropology simply evolves to an understanding of societies as fixed systems which reproduce themselves, and what we put emphasis on is the fixity of those systems, then we might miss all this, all this, uh, all this uh, process through which we discover what can be a possible world, a possible uh, practice, a possible feeling, a possible world. And I think on that, we can go beyond the idea of, uh, of uh, the census as a normative uh, suggestion. I think we need to enlarge the idea of consensus as a dynamic uh, understanding of negotiations, which can even include, and I will stop here, which can even include the gift, the idea of gift. Because if you try to discuss in conditions of inequality as if you were equal, then you lose most of it. I mean, let's take the example of someone who participates in an assembly who is an academic, and he is very well intended in contributing to this assembly, which includes neighborhood people who are, might be workers, uh, you know, civil servants, uh, small entrepreneurs, and so on and so forth. We know that he or she he has a very important uh, uh, advantage. He or she knows how to speak. He or she knows how to articulate ideas. And that might be very important, power over all the others. So how do we use this? Maybe sometimes we have to shut up okay, and listen. So this is a form of gift. I, I offer the fact that I diminish myself in the process of acquiring new possibilities of equality, the process of gift. So consensus can be very, very 
rich process, and we have learned a lot from the things that happen in the squares, how consensus can indeed be established as a very rich process, and not simply as a process in which agreement is imposed. Okay, thank you, Stavros, for this. Um, let's move to the next presentation. Okay, uh, Gunaydan. That's the only word I've learned so far in Turkish, so uh, good morning. I think my presentation is going to flow nicely from Stavros's, uh, especially the last discussion on consensus and um, issues of uh, rural com uh, the rural commons, which uh, Christo raised. Um, but first, I th I'd like to thank uh, my hosts. It's great to be here. I'm already feeling at home. Um, the snacks that are laid out during the breaks, the sweets that I've already eaten yesterday, um, the smelly toilet, all of this reminds me of home. The smelly <laughs> men's toilet, okay, not, I don't know about the men's. Um, so it's, it's nice to be here and of course the warmth of the people, most important. Um, a couple of caveats before I start. One is that normally I do this presentation over about an hour. Um, this is going to be half an hour, so there will be some things that I will run through rather quickly and will feel simplistic. And I hope that we can go deeper into those in the, uh, in the discussion. Um, there are some publications that I've put outside for those of you who are interested in reading further. One of the uh, publications that, on which this presentation is based is a book that a couple of us did a, couple, a few years back, which I have a couple of copies of here. And in the spirit of uh, non-monetized exchange. If there is somebody who's willing to give me something in return, I'd be happy to uh, give these couple of copies. Um, and finally, of course, I think there are a few of you who've probably seen this presentation and you're welcome to take a nap because it's going to be somewhat similar to what you may have seen just a couple of weeks back. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think the, uh, normally I also do about 15, 20 minutes of the crisis that countries like India are going through. I'm going to skip that. And just point to the fact that uh, this is something that probably everybody in this room will agree to, and if not, we can of course have a discussion, which is that the current form of what is called development or growth um, is a form of violence, both to nature, as you see in the uh, top right-hand uh, picture, which is advertisement by an Indian multinational corporation, and it's a form of violence against communities, peoples, um, cultures, uh, and uh, taking off again from Stavros's presentation against the commons. So uh, clearly it's something uh, for which we need, we need to change the system. Now we also need to be aware of the fact that there are a lot of false solutions being presented to us. This is the year in which the United Nations, uh, all the countries of the world are going to be signing a sustainable development goals uh, 15 year or 20 year target, the post 2015 SDGs as they're called. And a lot of that is about the green economy, it's about techno fixes, financial measures, market mechanisms, compensatory measures, etc., etc., which to my mind, some of them may be interesting and important, but overall they are uh, what I call false solutions because they don't actually fundamentally challenge the system. Another form of false solution is what uh, I think was brilliantly presented yesterday which is about how ecology has become a fashion. So you have all these gated communities which are now suddenly green spaces, they're eco-friendly, they're about you know waking up with nature and things like that. So I'm not going to get into any of this in detail, uh, but we can in the discussion if we need to. Uh, to my mind, there is a need for a very fundamental shift in all spheres of human existence. And, but then what is that alternative? is the big question. Or what are those alternatives? Uh, what are, you know, fundamentally, how do we shift uh, and what do we shift to? So that's what my focus is going to be. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is actually learnings from the grassroots in India and from the discussions and debates and churning that is happening in a country like India. Um, but I think the resonance of uh, what I'm learning from India uh, has is probably global. I mean, I'm sure all of us here can in some way or the other resonate with it, even with differences. Part of the uh, 
shift to um, a fundamentally different alternative uh, vision for the future is, of course, resistance. Um, where uh, dominant political economic structures are imposing themselves on communities uh, or on people, and where people are resisting, including the examples that Stavros gave of the various squares, but also the examples of indigenous people or other local communities resisting mining or dams or ports or industrialization or urbanization, etc., uh, and resisting processes by which so-called dem democratic societies are actually imposing their economic and political values and cultural values on them, is very much part of the answer. One, because it provides a very important mirror uh, against what is happening in, in the name of development and progress. And secondly, because it gives us the time to find constructive alternative pathways. But the second crucial part, and this is where I think uh, uh, much more focus is needed by civil society and political society than has been the case so far, is uh, constructing these alternative pathways. And that's what I'm going to give you a few examples from India of different sectors and then the kind of lessons that we're learning from those examples. Now, um, anybody here who has eaten Indian food? <laughs> what? Only three or four? <laughs> Yay. Come on, wake up. Good morning. <laughs> um, yes. So, I'm going to do this in the form of a recipe, um, which has uh, four main ingredients. It will later on also have what is most important in Indian food, which is spices. Uh, and then we'll see what the dish that's being cooked up is. Okay, there's a, a small village in central India which has this very interesting slogan, which uh, is about uh, direct democracy. It says we elect the government or we, you know, it's our government in Mumbai and Delhi, but in our village we are the government. There's nobody else who will come and govern us. We will be governing, we will be self-governing. Now, this is a village called Medha Lekha. It's an indigenous village uh, uh, of about 500, 600 residents. And about 30 years back, they decided that all the decisions in the village that will be taken with regard to their lands and the surrounding areas will be taken through the village assembly, which includes all the men, women, and children, and that this will be by consensus. So the point that was just raised by Stavros about consensus, how do you actually reach fair means of consensus. This is a very interesting example of that. One of the things that they do is that uh, all dissent is encouraged. If there's even a single person in the assembly who uh, says, I still do not believe or agree with what you're saying, it, the discussions will go on and it might actually get completely reversed. Um, but one of the interesting things that they do is that they study, they set up these study circles, much like we do in our universities, and these study circles, which could be three of the villagers or three villagers plus some professor from outside or some NGO or whatever, they will look at the issue that is going to come up before the village assembly. They'll put together all the relevant information, both traditional, local, and outside knowledge, and that then goes to the assembly uh, so that it is an informed decision that they're taking. Through all these and other processes, they have taken back um, what was the commons, but which was enclosed through colonial history in India and then subsequently by independent governments. Um, they have taken control back over uh, all the forests that, they, that surround them, which they use, which they have traditionally used and which they depend on. And uh, a couple of years back, they also put all the agricultural land of the community, in, of individuals, into, uh, into the commons so that every square inch of land in this village now is actually part of the commons and it goes through this assembly decision-making process. Another example uh, is from the cities. I don't have too many examples from cities, but there are a few. Um, and this one is about uh, people in, city, in some cities in India saying, why should the budgets of the city be determined by bureaucrats or politicians? Why not by those of us for whom the budgets are meant? So there is a process, a grassroots up process of trying to actually influence the budgeting through what is called participatory budgeting. And uh, I would imagine, Stavros, this could be one example of a sort of a re-commoning or a commoning of what is otherwise enclosed by the state. Um, and there are many other such similar processes of decentralized uh, decision making that, uh, that are being attempted in other cities. 
Another example that I'll give is uh, is from Western India, Rajasthan, a very low rainfall area, where for about a decade there was a process in which 65 villages along one river, so uh, they basically they formed a parliament, and that parliament was supposed to be governing and managing the entire river basin of 400 square kilometers. Uh, and so all the decisions relating to that basin, which was not just about, well, it started with the issue of water sharing, because if upstream villages would take away all the water, then the downstream villages would not get it. So a process of looking at what is an equitable sharing of water, which then also led into things like forest conservation, cropping patterns, law and order, and inter-village disputes, and things like that. Uh, it's been running into problems uh, of late for various reasons, but for a decade or so this worked. It was a very interesting initiative looking at much larger processes of democratic, direct democratic decision making uh, at each village level and then working upwards. Taking some of these examples, this first ingredient to my mind has three very crucial components. The first of course is direct democracy, which could be at the level of the urban neighborhood, the village or a cluster of villages, or whatever other even new communities that are being formed, as, as I think Stavros has very rightly said. The second component of that, of course, is that you cannot have direct face-to-face -face democracy at larger scale. 1.3 billion Indians obviously can't meet together anywhere uh, to discuss things face-to-face. -face. So you need processes of delegated or uh, representative democracy but which are uh, moving much beyond what we have right now in terms of being much more accountable to the grassroots level through the direct democracy units. And the example um, of that cluster of villages uh, was one of those. And that example also leads us to another one which I think is uh, in one way quite a uh, mind shift which is that the boundaries of decision making that we have right now, the, the current political boundaries of decision making, whether they're within countries or between countries, uh, need to be questioned from an ecological and cultural standpoint. Are they ecologically relevant? Are they culturally relevant? Or are they actually uh, accidents of history where a line has been drawn uh, between what were contiguous ecologies and contiguous cultures? Certainly in the South Asian context that is the case where uh, contiguous ecosystems and cultures or, or spaces of uh, transhuman, um, uh, trans ecosystem movement have been cut by the India-Pakistan border, the India-China border, the India-Bangladesh border, etc. You find uh, that we, uh, at least we need to start questioning those sorts of boundaries to see whether in fact we have to reimagine uh, political decision making based on ecosystems and cultures. I'm leaving it at that right now. In the discussion, we can go into this in more detail. The second <coughs> crucial ingredient is economics. Now, I've used a bit of uh, wordplay here, um, which is a combination of English and Hindi or Sanskrit, which is Arthashastra is economics in, in Hindi. Um, so a little bit of a punning there. Um, the phrase economics as if the earth mattered or economics as if people mattered comes from a Gandhian economist called Kumarappa, um, which well, I don't have a name here, but I'll give it to you later if you want, um, which uh, essentially was about uh, Gandhi, uh, Mohandas Karamjan Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi actually never wrote economics, but a lot of what he wrote has elements of economics in it. So what Kumarappa as an economist did was to pick out those elements and say what would be a Gandhian economics. He has a very interesting book, um, which is economics as a, uh, The Economics of Permanence. Um, a few examples of where people have tried to do things differently from the current system in which it's either the state or capitalists who are taking the economic decisions or who have control over the means of production. Uh, and uh, processes in which because of this and because of a number of other factors, we see this massive rural-urban migration. It's a global phenomenon in India. It is predicted, predicted that within the next 15 to 20 years, 50% of India will be in cities. Of course, in Europe, you've already reached and gone well beyond that. But in India, it's still a process underway. Now, already our cities are, are groaning and creaking. If any of you has been to any of the Indian big cities, you will know that. 
Um, so another 25% of India's population actually moving into cities is a huge nightmare. So here are a few places where, in fact, the, the process has been reversed. Where, because uh, through a whole series of uh, rural revitalization programs led by the villagers themselves, uh, especially with things like water and other natural resources, local livelihoods, um, dealing with social inequalities, and I'll come back to that in a minute, these uh, villages have become vibrant economic and social spaces, and people who had actually earlier moved out into cities have moved back. Many families have actually come back, or out-migration has, has significantly reduced and, and been stopped. Another very interesting process is where producers are challenging the economic system and saying, why should we be the ones who are worst off in the economic uh, sector, where all the profits or the revenues are gained by traders or by retailers or by the final uh, value-added ad producers and not by us as primary producers. So the attempt is to actually create cooperatives and companies uh, which are run by the producers themselves on democratic lines in which they actually try and uh, gain control over the entire chain from the production to the retail. This is an interesting example of textiles from Western India, some of the most beautiful textiles in the country, where about two or three thousand women run these cooperatives and, and companies and uh, are able to uh, gain much more, much better livelihoods through that. This is an example of a state government initiative, just to also say that governments can also sometimes, sometimes get it right, uh, which is a, a, an enterprise that actually supports uh, about 300,000 families for upgrading their traditional skills on crafts. Metal, uh, cane, bamboo, silk, handlooms, painting, singing, drawing, etc. And um, helping them with small inputs like raw materials if they're not available, better uh, machinery, uh, handlooms for instance, and then marketing. So that entire chain of again economic activity uh, increasingly managed by the producers themselves through state support. And finally, an example from a city, this is the city I live in, where about four or five thousand women who work, who have worked in traditionally very degrading uh, and socially uh, ostracized occupations like waste collection have uh, enhanced their social status and economic status through unionizing through negotiating with the state, uh, with the uh, city administration, and with households for uh, everything from segregation of waste to much better health conditions, much better conditions of dealing with the waste, much better revenues from selling the waste or recycling it, uh, and things like that. So again, just a few examples which point to a different economics. Uh, one, of course, part of that is clearly that of being mindful of planetary uh, limits. Um, but the other, I think, really crucial one, and this is especially important in the context of the economic globalization that we are going through in India, and which the whole world is going through, of course, is the local economic localization, which is not to say that everything is produced locally in a village, but to say that at least for basic needs, um, which is not just basic needs, basic physical needs, but also things like health and education, etc., that that can be something in which the local cluster of villages and or villages and a town can be self-sufficient. You don't need to depend on somebody 3,000 kilometers away for your water or for your power, energy or whatever. Uh, so that is, uh, with localization, uh, the control over the means of production uh, and, of course, consumer movements, consumption, the move towards actually even dissolving this artificial distinction that we've created between producers and consumers. So, you know, you're a farmer, you're a producer, I'm a, I eat it, so I'm a consumer. But in fact, actually beginning to see how we may be both. Not that I also become a farmer, but that I'm producing something else which you are using, and so therefore, we're actually all becoming prosumers. Um, the idea of, of uh, local currencies and non-monetized exchanges uh, India has traditionally had a very strong barter system, which is in, uh, it's on the decline. Of course, it's also been socially exploitative, but we can actually reimagine, recreate it in a different new context to see how do we move ourselves away from this really hegemony of, of money that is on all, on all our minds, and which is the one that actually creates enormous problems, including financial corruption, which is, of course, as you know, very big in India. 
and uh, finally of course moving beyond moving beyond our current indicators of what is wealth and progress and, and uh, prosperity especially gdp which is a completely meaningless uh, totally nonsensical uh, indicator for any kind of progress but looking at uh, for instance things like basic needs does the entire population actually have basic needs are we satisfied are we happy do we have good social relationships um, and so on and so forth so that's the second ingredient how am i doing on time 15 minutes ah. okay the third ingredient is uh, is justice and uh, this is absolutely important in the context of india because as you uh, some of you i mean some most of you know about the caste system are you all aware of the caste system we okay, just quickly i mean basically in india you're born into a caste which is a social status and it's a, there is a strong hierarchy of caste so if you're a, if you're born into the priest or the educated class you're the highest caste sorry you're the highest if you're you know so there's various different gradations that you have and uh, 200 million or 250 million indians are actually not even in the caste system they are so called outcasts which is that they're so because they used to be doing the ones that doing the work that was most considered most uh, degrading like uh, you know uh, cleaning all toilets and things like that or working with leather and uh, so issues of social justice which are class gender caste etc are absolutely crucial a uh, couple of examples to show how people have tried to deal with them this is a very very interesting example of small women farmers who are dalits so dalits are this so called outcasts that i just mentioned um over the last about 30 years they have completely transformed their lives through reviving traditional forms of agriculture um going completely organic bringing back into production some 80 different kinds of varieties of uh, seeds millets and pulses and so on uh, linking this to a local uh, market a marketing system which is uh, in their own villages and in nearby town uh, securing or trying to secure land rights for women which again is very unusual in in a country like india uh, and many other such things through this and also then through becoming Uh, good at communications they run their own film making studio they run their own community radio which goes to 200 300 villages uh, they run their own school because they believe that the government school is really bad which is true uh, and many other such things they have uh, they have not just transformed their food situation their food sovereign now whereas earlier they in fact had they had food scarcity but also their social status as dalits so their caste status is much better now they are actually Uh, not looked down upon in fact the so called upper castes come to them and ask them for advice on things like you know sustainability of agriculture uh, as women their status is much much more equal than used to be the case and so on it's a long story which i'm cutting short so that's one way of dealing with the inequalities or injustices in cities we see similar processes this is a town called bhuj in western india where the poor uh, the colonies of the poor the so called squatters or slums have uh, mobilized themselves with the help of local uh, ngos to provide themselves with uh, decentralized water supply they are now 100% water self sufficient uh, much better housing using local materials claiming uh, land rights on which they have squatted and many other such processes basically becoming also part of deciding what the city should be uh similar to i think stavros what he was saying as to actually becoming creators of or in some senses sort of definers of the city so uh that's the third ingredient which is really about justice fourth is knowledge and cultures now uh in india this is again absolutely crucial because well everywhere else but certainly in india if you look at it the cultural diversity of the country is just incredible we recently had a people survey of uh, languages in india which came up with uh, um c- existing living languages in india being about 800 these are not dialects these are independent living languages 300 or so have already died out but there's still 800 left uh, similarly with food i mean and and so on so the cultural diversity and with that of course the knowledge diversity is really crucial now one big challenge we have here is our education system essentially our education system is geared towards creating people who will fit into the current uh economic and political system right the capitalist system or the state dominated systems 
Um, and so it's exactly, you know, producing what uh, Pete Seeger had called Little Boxes. Anybody here heard Pete Seeger's song, Little Boxes, the American folk singer? It's, yeah, so you're just creating little, little boxes to fit into the system. The only difference might be one is blue, one is red, etc. So, but otherwise they're all... So, uh, that's what our education system is. So, here are a few attempts at actually trying to create a learning or an educational system which is truly alternative, which is actually trying to, first of all, instill uh, faith and, uh, sorry, uh, uh, confidence and uh, amongst the children of, with, of their own cultures, their own ecological roots, their own cultural roots, their own historical roots, and while learning there are th things that are coming from outside, not lose sight of those roots. So they're actually much more rooted than is the case otherwise. If you otherwise look at it in local communities in India, the education system is tending to take them away. They're tending to say, you're primitive, your languages are of no use, you need to learn English, etc., and are alienating them from their own roots. But that's not to say that they remain there in those situations. We also have <laughs> In all of these examples, you're also being able to, you are also exposed to the outside world. You're, you're learning what things are learning outside. Um, but, and it's that combination of traditional and modern, local and outside, formal and informal. So the teachers are not only the PhDs, but also the local village expert, who's very good at, say, identifying plants in the forest, or who's very good at farming, is also a teacher in that school. So it's a very different way of trying to actually create an educational system. And finally, of course, in, in ways of knowledge and knowing is about technologies, is about the production of knowledge, um, which needs to become far more, traditionally was, but needs to become far more democratic. It's not just about a few expert institutions who are creating that knowledge and then everybody has to follow that. But everybody, all of us, are actually repositories of skills and knowledge. And that, that democratic process of creating it, again, examples where much more ecologically friendly and much more people accessible technologies are created through these kinds of processes in India. So uh, that last ingredient therefore is again um, a whole lot of different things relating to knowledge and culture and technologies. And I don't have the time to go into all of this right now but basically uh, let me just also flag the last one which I haven't spoken about which is really again being able to not just relate to each other in ways that are ethical which are crucial, not just economic relationships, but also ethical social relationships, but also go deeper into oneself. Uh, and of course, in India, there's lots of old traditions of that. But there are dangers to that, which maybe we can speak about uh, later, especially in the current context of the government right now, which is trying to essentially say that India is a Hindu society. So Hinduism as a religion is kind of becoming dominant. So well, it, there are two sort of um, uh, two sides to the sword here, uh, and we can discuss that later. Okay, so all these four dishes, uh, four ingredients put together, uh, the dish um, that we're coming up with is what we've called in this book radical ecological democracy. An Indian term for that is uh, Harit Swaraj or Eco Swaraj. The word Swaraj is something that Gandhi used a lot, but it of course predates him. And it's uh, unfortunately got corrupted into meaning independent country. So India seeking independence from Britain as a colonial power. But actually Swaraj is right, is everything from the freedom of the individual to the freedom of, of people and humanity as such. And it's a very deep concept which, again, we can go into in the discussion. But the, essentially what uh, radical ecological democracy is, um, very simply put, a process of uh, decision making, a process of relating to each other in which we are all part uh, of this, we are we all share the power to do this, but we do it in ways that are ecologically and socially responsible, ecologically sustainable, socially sensitive, equitable, etc., uh, etc. Et and the most crucial part of this is that we then are putting our uh, faith, so to speak, not in the state, nor in corporations, but in the community. And I take very well what Stavros has said. So community is not just what has been determined through history as like the village community or whatever, but it can be continuously evolving. It's a self-defined process of uh, or units of, of uh, identity in some way. Um, and But so it is in fact that ordinary person, all of us, who actually become the locus of power, not the state nor the corporation. Um, let me end by, uh, oh, just quickly also, okay, I'll come back to this in a minute. Huh, yeah. Um, 
yeah, as I said, India, of course, without spices, Indian food would be useless. So uh, to me, actually, the most important part of all of this is not that you can actually replicate uh, one example that I've given here and put it somewhere else. This is the mistake that a lot of NGOs and, of course, governments make that you find something nice happening and, okay, let's do it all over the world. It's actually more about learning what values are coming out of, what principles are arising from these examples that people are uh, talking about or doing. And I've just listed here a few. I'm sure many more could be listed. And I'm not going to go into each of these in detail. We can maybe put this up again later if you're interested. But um, these, I, to my mind, these are these. This is a set of values and principles which runs completely contradictory and counter to the currently dominant systems. Uh, just to take one example, if you look at number three, cooperation, solidarity in the commons, it's totally different from what we are taught in school these days. At least again in India, where uh, my main goal in life, in after I leave call, school and college, should be to become rich powerful and famous, if possible all three, but at least one of these. Uh, so whereas in fact here it says no, I mean your goal in life is not that, it's about actually relating to other people, about trying to see how humanity as a whole, or your community as a whole, or your class as a whole, and other species also of course, are able to um, evolve, uh, become more prosperous, not in an economic sense, but in terms of what we hold dear in our lives. So uh, I'm going to leave it at this, um, just quickly to go back and tell you about a couple of processes that we're doing, which are trying to spread this through uh, other parts of India. We have uh, something called the Vikalp Sangam, which is an alternative confluence. As you probably know, a confluence of rivers in India has always been a very sacred spot. Uh, similarly, this is a confluence of, of uh, ideas, opinions, initiatives, experiences, disputes, debates, dialogues amongst people who are involved with these sorts of grassroots experimentation or with conceptualizing them and we're trying to bring them together in different parts of India and hopefully eventually at a national scale. The other thing we're doing is uh, we realize that there is no single place in which we can actually find all these different initiatives. So we have started a website last year, please visit that. I always tell people that if you're ever feeling depressed when you read the new morning newspapers, please visit this website. It will cheer you up because there's lots of fantastic stuff happening. And of course, this is just India. There's, again, lots, lots elsewhere. And that becomes really crucial also, is the attempt to actually try and do more things like this, where we learn from each other, where similar initiatives happening in other parts of the world could teach us, where what we are doing could maybe give inputs to others. So I've just put a few examples here. All of them, in some way or the other, none of them perfect but things one can learn from. And that brings me to the last point, which is when we speak against economic globalization, people say, are you then against globalization? And the uh, response is no. It's a different form of globalization that we need. It's this kind of stuff. It's the exchange of ideas and initiatives, cultures, even materials, but in ways that are not dominated by the current financial, economic powers or political powers, but where it's a people-to-people -people exchange, community-to-community -community exchange. And we need much more of that. Just going to put up a few points here, my own questions for dialogue and discussion, where I think I certainly need much more inputs. That's a few. I'm sure there are many more. And the last one I think is really important. Even if we agree on some future visions of this kind, how do we get there and who is going to do it? Is it going to be academics uh, and students? trade unions, people's movements, what does that mean? What kind of people's movements, uh, political parties? Who is going to be leading this uh, pathway to change? Thank you. There's some more stuff on the website. So. OK, thank you, Ashish. So we have uh, just, we're going to focus now on questions of clarification. So if you have a in-depth kind of comments, please, we'll get to those after the, the coffee break. Jack, one big one. Hi, thank you, Ashish. Um, I just want to point out uh, two points relative to two of the uh, images that you used. The first one is related to uh, uh, economic. If you can put again, please because this is very important. I will never use that kind of comics because it's uh, really ethics and we need 
politics when we speak about uh, the problems of economic growth. The, the one that you have with the boat, uh, we are all in the same boat. This is a very ah. ethical point of criticizing the growth economics. But uh, if you want to use it, you should use uh, then also another one in which we are in the boat and the people in power are flying over us with uh, airplanes. Okay. Otherwise, we just raise real ethical uh, critiques <laughs> of the economy of growth. So okay. we lose the political that is very important in um, fighting against the economic growth uh, ideas. We are not in the same boat. There are people that are flying over us. Um, first point. The, the second point is about uh, the picture that you used uh, to show the, um, the villages. If you can put a little bit, because it's very important also to me to look at it. Sorry, which uh, one? The one that are where there is a circle of people uh, ah. speaking to each other. It's the villages, uh, that one on the top. Yeah, yeah, this one. That uh, According to me, there is a clear order in which uh, even if you can speak about, uh, you know, um, a process of consensus, the order that uh, it's clear to me, no, there are uh, men, uh, on one side and a woman on another side already speak about the powerless or uh, powerful discourses that can raise in a consensus process. I mean, from this order, the voices are different. So f I want to use this because it's very important, uh, the example of Strauss about uh, uh, the fact that the people in, that uh, uh, have a power in a context like uh, the academics, supposedly they have a power of uh, uh, using words and so on and so far. So I'm really keen on this uh, uh, idea of uh, the anthropology of ab absence. So the capacity of being uh, able to shut down himself. But uh, I'm really concerned in the assemblies, not as a powerful person, but with the powerless people. I mean, the people that cannot speak because they are not able to do that. So. I think that one of the um, things that we have to reflect a little bit more is about is the common vision that we have in the future only a process in which we will have consensus or we really think that sometimes the votes are very important. Let's think that I think, for example, that uh, the secret vote is a very important uh, process that we have in our culture because uh, the secret vote is for the people that uh, are not powerful, but often powerless. They are under threat for different reasons. So I think we have, uh, uh, let's say, reflect a little bit about the commons, the, the, the process of consensus, and also how it relates to the legitimation of vote in some context. I respond to these now? I think the second question is a very interesting and maybe a complex one, so we can come back to that after the break. Um, just a quick one on the first one about being in the same boat. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree and disagree. I mean, I think uh, in one sense, yes, those guys are, or all of us are actually up there in the air. Um, but in another sense, we're all doomed, uh, including those who are currently in power. So I think the cartoonist was kind of using it in that, in the second sense, saying that we need, even those who are currently in power need to recognize somewhere or the other, I mean, they may or may not, I mean, I don't know if somebody sitting up on the 26th floor will suddenly have a brain wave, but need to recognize that ultimately, I mean, uh, the whole earth is threatened by what we're doing right now. So, it's both, I mean, in the sense that currently, yeah, I mean, those who are flying around don't, are not imperiled in the same way that poor people are, but ultimately, all of us are. Uh, thanks, Ashish. I just want to ask a question in relation to the way you position values and principles. You mentioned, uh, you said these are the like uh, spices, and spices uh, depends on taste. Uh, whereas I would like uh, take it as one of the key ingredients because values and principles will drive the transformative uh, process, and uh, so. Uh, I would like uh, you comment on that. Okay, clearly uh, my presentation has a lot of allegories and uh, images which 
could be problematic. Yeah, um, I think put in that way, I would probably agree with you. Um, but ingredients also depends on choices. In India, you can make a kadhi, I don't know if you saw any, virtually any dish with different ingredients also. So it's a little bit of a, I mean, if you look at the generic dishes, that is that you can. Uh, like a dosa, I mean, a South Indian dosa, how many people have had? You can actually make a dosa with rice, you can make it with pulses, you can make it with millets. Um, and what spices you put in also then will depend on taste. So uh, maybe one shouldn't get too bogged down by the imagery that I've used. Uh, or if somebody's interested in helping me with better imagery, I'd be very happy to do that. But your main point that you're making is absolutely right. That that it is that the values are the at the base in some sense, the, the fundamentals of what we do. Um, and in that sense, maybe one should say that, I mean, OK, so in some way or the other, it is an absolutely essential ingredient of, so maybe, maybe let's say it's the energy. For all cooking, you need some energy, right? I mean, some form, maybe it's whether it's solar or gas or whatever. So it is actually, in that sense, the energy which is required for. But uh, the only thing that I think we need to add here, and maybe we can do that in discussion, discussion on the values is, uh, this, this question which I don't know, I'm not clear about myself yet, is that do we actually need that whole, for any initiative to be successful or for a transformation to happen, do we actually need that whole set of values? Can we make do with some? Are some more important, some less, impor uh, less important, uh, etc.? And I don't, I'm not clear in my own head on that. So I think uh, that would be interesting. Over the last few years, one of the processes that we've used, and there's a document out there, uh, which if you're interested in, which is called a framework conceptual note on alternatives, which is evolving through these uh, confluences that we are doing, where uh, people are actually adding to the list of values. So even from having started with six or seven in the beginning, uh, we already now have, I think, more than a dozen. And that's a very interesting discussion and dialogue. It's because people hold different values dear to their heart. Uh, what your values you hold might be slightly different from the ones I hold. But so do we have a set that's common? And then beyond that, there are some more that you know you feel are important. I don't feel they're important. I, it's a discussion dialogue I think that we need to have. Uh, and then if you do it between cultures, then it becomes that much more complex, but that much more fascinating. Okay, so uh, Eric, uh, the other thing is we have one and a half hours after the coffee. So maybe if there's things that are more, unless it's a specific thing about the presentation, we can enter into more discussion after. Okay. So should we maybe have a coffee break now and then come back and continue? So just a quick announcement, I think, uh, before we go. Yeah, just to say that we will stay in this room after the coffee break. But then after lunch, we will move to another room. So that's basically once you move up to the big uh, square with the lawn, you move right across it, so basically opposite to where we are. And there's a building with a canteen at the, at the bottom, and we are in the level floor, so there will be a sign. It's called Özger Arnas. Corresponds to the city as is an agglomeration of enclaves. You, you probably are well familiar with this discussion. Today's cities are more like uh, um, uh, forms of, uh, of, of relations that de define a kind of uh, uh, order which is not the order of the city of zones or the fantasized order of the city of zones, to be more accurate, but it's rather the peculiar and, and uh, sometimes not easily uh, traceable order of the city of enclaves, that is self-defining and self-enclosing areas in which certain uh, procedures are being, uh, being performed, certain acts are being per permitted, certain behaviors are being encouraged. So the city of enclaves indeed produces institutions that corrupt the common because it tends to enclose in those enclaves areas of potential sharing, but in which those who participate in the sharing are not allowed most of the times to define the rules, are not allowed to question or to challenge the laws. Mostly they are allowed to enter this process of sharing without, however, being able to define the rules. And sometimes what they share is probably their misery or their, their, their idea of being excluded 
from this enclave. So we know these are very well-known pictures, just to remind you. A gated community is, a, is an enclave, uh, an urban enclave, that can be considered as an area in which the commons is being corrupted. Okay? In, a, in a gated community, commoning appears to be a process through which certain uh, inhabitants share certain facilities, share all, also may share certain processes. There are, in many cases, a, a kind of uh, imitation of the very process through which people uh, participate in taking decisions, but in the end they do not take decisions. They simply participate in a simulation of participatory democracy. Most of the times they simply share some facilities, uh, and, a, and a board of uh, managers takes most of the decisions. So this is a corrupted area of commoning. Uh, however, we can learn from aspects of urban commoning uh, which indeed happen in our cities and try to understand if there are possibilities of urban commoning inside, inherent possibilities in urban, in urban commoning that can go beyond existing uh, domination and existing capitalist relations. And I would briefly say that we have at least three, uh, two areas in which we can find uh, institutions of commoning that tend to be open, that is not corrupted. Uh, <clears throat> it is a made term, uh, and it's probably made mostly by, uh, by people who were, by scholars who were involved with indigenous thought. And they try to express with this word uh, not the fact that we have something in common, Commonalidad. Commonality is being translated usually in, in English, but it's not easy, easily uh, a good translation. I, I believe that it leaves a lot out. Huh? Commonalidad is, as Esteva tries to say, the juxtaposition of commons and polity. It is a process that defines its stakes and also takes place. Okay? So, uh, from that, from the comparison between the idea that commons is a relation, which is being performed. And also community is a process through which stakes are being defined and a polemic over the common develops. I end up uh, thinking about commons, uh, trying to use mostly commoning rather than commons as a thing, or commons as an area of, of, uh, of investigation. If commoning is to be a process, because in commoning, not only what is at stake in sharing is being defined, but also a community that defines itself through commoning, then commoning is indeed a dynamic process that could possibly lead to a transgression, to a kind of after, a beyond existing capitalist societies, and I would try to explore a bit this possibility. <coughs> uh, to connect this to the city, uh, if the city is not simply an arrangement of places, okay, if, if the city is not simply an order, a spatial order, but indeed the city also is a space of possibilities, or if you want, is a performed space, a space which happens because people are being uh, related to each other, then urban commoning might be a, a, a kind of commoning, a, a, an aspect of commoning perhaps, which at least, as I understand it, should not only be connected to things that happen or exist in the city, or to resources connected with the urban environment, but perhaps urban commoning has to do with urban space both as a medium and as a stake. Okay? Urban space can be indeed a form of shared thing, a kind of commons, but what distinguishes, I think, urban space from other kinds of commons is the fact that urban space is also a shaping factor of processes of commoning. So this is how I would try to... Oops. So... Uh, Thank you very much for this invitation. I really like uh, the idea that uh, this discussion on commons is being developed 
through various networks, uh, that is through forms that are suitable for the, the process uh, that corresponds to commoning. And allow me to share some thoughts with you in the process of uh, trying to enter a discussion that is uh, obviously a discussion that has uh, conflicting points of view. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the discussion on commons is simply a discussion on a very specific topic on which we all agree. It's rather a, a process through which we keep on defining the terms, keep on defining the points of view, and take insights if you want. So my way of entering this discussion is putting an emphasis rather on the politics of commoning uh, and not on the e economy of commoning. Uh, this, of course, make it more, makes it more suitable uh, in the context of your discussions and, and your, uh, your workshops in this uh, summer school. But also, uh, I think, is already a form of taking sides in uh, an ongoing uh, dispute, an ongoing debate about the meaning of commons. So I would, uh, first of all, attempt to enter this discussion by trying to understand uh, what a community might be in the context of the discussion of commoning. I start with, uh, uh, with uh, Ranchier's uh, understanding of, uh, of politics, uh, which I think is a, a really uh, helpful understanding in the context of our um, um, discussion on commons, because he conceives politics as a polemic over the common. Indeed, the community is based on this polemic over the common. And when this polemic over the common, which I will try shortly to describe how I understand it, is, uh, is uh, not taking place, is uh, kind of stopped, then Ranchier thinks that uh, community, society in general, evolves to a kind of police order. Yes, probably the term is a bit too exaggerated uh, as, a as a term, but indeed tries to mark the difference between politics as a movement, as a process of movement. Uh, the, 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 the I did something wrong. No. This is why I will try to connect this discussion to the idea of institutions. Uh, <coughs> let's remember community as a polemic over the common, a process through which the common is being defined. What is the role of institutions? Uh, what do we mean by institutions? Allow me to, to take uh, uh, a definition or an understanding of institution that does not come from political theory, but rather from anthropology, which means that institutions are not simply uh, forms that uh, are reproducing existing relations of power, but perhaps in a more general sense, are tools, social tools, through which a repeatability of actions, a predictability of actions is being uh, implemented. If we take this rather broad definition, which of course includes relations of power, but it's more than that, then <coughs> um, it is important to see how institutions are, can be connected to processes of commoning. Is commoning establishing itself through forms of repeatability. And what kinds of forms of repeatability can go along with an ongoing process of definition of the commons? What kinds of forms of repeatability can go along with a polemic over the common? It seems to be a kind of contradiction, OK? But come on. I'm just used to another kind of computer and pressing the wrong buttons. <coughs> so. I think that we should and can distinguish between two at least different kinds of institutions that are, can be connected to commoning. According to some definitions that have to do with uh, the well-known uh, understanding of commons by Hart and Engry and relevant thinkers, as G.G. Roger, there are institutions that is forms of repeatability, forms of definition of reproduction of acts and meanings through which, indeed, uh, the common is being corrupted. That's the term they use. That is, uh, at least to my understanding, 
These are forms through which the common loses its meaning, is being transformed perhaps to its opposite. And how is commons or, or how is commoning as a process can be transformed to its opposite if it is directed not to a, fro to, to, to a condition through which people share things and define what is to be shared, but rather to a condition through which certain people define for all the others what is to be shared, under what conditions, and enclose the process, that is, define the limits of this process. And indeed, this kind of institutions continues dispute over what it is that we should consider as common, uh, as opposed to a society which, which is kind of ossified, fossilized, uh, does not breathe, does not change, does not transform itself, and ends up being a kind of fixed order. So I think uh, if we combine this idea with the idea coming from a, a theorist uh, uh, from Uruguay, from uh, Latin America, who believes that indeed a community is a process and not a stable arrangement of, of uh, relations, that keeps on repeating itself, <clears throat> then we end up understanding uh, indeed uh, community as a process through which a common world is created. A common world can be, of course, an enclosed common world, that is a world that we are forced to share, that we are forced to participate, and in this way we are forced to agree with the major presuppositions that are supporting this common world, or, and I would tend to support the next, the, this, this uh, understanding of the common world, or a common world can be a process. A common world as a process may correspond to a community as a process, to a community as a process which is being developed through various forms of polemic over the common. And I would, uh, in this, in this uh, conceptualization of, of community, I would connect an understanding of commons and commoning indeed again as a process that does not simply try to establish certain forms of sharing or certain items, products, things to be shared, but indeed a process through which what is to be considered as common is to be redefined. It's a, it's a dynamic pro process. That's why I try to, to integrate to this, uh, to this understanding of commons two contributions. The one is probably you know most of you, the definition by David Harvey, which is a bit complicated, but what it says in the end is that it's more commons is not a thing, but a relation, okay? It's a relation which is, I would add, which is performed. It happens. It takes place in a certain context, a social context. I would uh, try to compare this understanding of commons, the definition of a common word, which is a process, which is based on the creation and the, and the dispute about social relations, with the idea of communalidad, which is an idea that comes actually from Latin America also, 